Hello, and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. Today's a very special day. Every day is special on With Five, but today's a very special day because, or for a number of reasons, it is the twice annual With Pod mailbag episode, and we have a new special friend guest today. So if you're a listener of the podcast, you know that once or twice a year, we do a mailbag episode. We solicit input and emails, tweets, questions, and feedback compliments, which we love from you guys about how great we are, how great the podcast is, and then we just read them back to you. <laughs> it's good content. And uh, so we do that We do that twice a year. I've been pushing for like every other week, but Tiffany sort of vetoed that. But we have a new person introduced today who you may know of, um, who is Donnie Holloway. Donnie joined us last calendar year in 2021 as a full-time Why Is This Happening producer works on the podcast uh, along with Tiffany, who still works on the podcast as well and who is our line producer on the nightly show. So, and Tiffany and Donnie are both here, but Donnie, welcome to your first on-air appearance on Why Is This Happening? It's great to have you. Thank you so much, Chris. I've been looking so forward to my WithPod debut and really glad to be a part of the team. And Tiffany, how are you doing? <laughs> oh, good. No, I'm doing good. You can be honest. Wait, are we going to violate HIPAA if we talk about the winter that you two have had? <laughs> I was thinking about that. So we had solicited these requests for your emails. We look forward to the mailbag, like Chris said. It's a great chance for us to talk about the show, to hear what you guys are saying. And so we had plans to do this before the end of the year and then have this be like the kickoff of 2022. We have done yep. all this great stuff in 2021. We have big plans coming up for you. And then... Your girl got COVID. Your girl got COVID. No. no, give us no, give us the full context because like you were not. I, now we should all know. All three of us live in New York City, and mm -hmm. for people that are New York adjacent, and I think this was true in DC and Boston to a certain. But there was like a few weeks in December where literally everyone got COVID. Yes, and it was in that time, but you were not here. Yeah. So I, as uh, longtime listeners know, I'm from the Chicago area. And I had plans to drive home for the holidays, like a week or two before Christmas. And we had an Airbnb. We had all of our normal precautions that we were going to take. And the night before, we were set to drive from New York to Chicago. I thought, I've got a bit of a tickle in my throat. This is sort of weird. And it, Omicron hadn't quite popped yet. It hadn't started. It wasn't as big of the thing that we know it is to be now. And so I thought, you know what, I'll take a quick rapid test. It'll be fine. I took a rapid test, negative. All right. I'm not going to be the person who panics because I have allergies or a sinus. I'll drive home, got there, took another test, and it turned out to be COVID. So I spent 14 hours driving across the country and then spent 10 days quarantining in an Airbnb over the holidays. And fortunately, my isolation was up in time for my birthday. I got to see my family just in time for me to turn back around and drive back to New York. And so in that time, we were supposed to record our mailbag, but I was both exhausted and also emotionally devastated. And I said, guys, can we push it off? So then we pushed it off to the beginning of so the year. So we pushed year. off to the beginning of the year. And I should note, not to get too up in your business with the listeners, but your partner was with you. You were not alone. Yeah. Just if people are listening to this, they're like, are you alone for 10 days? So your partner's with you. Yes. So you had someone kind of tending yeah. to you. And you had a pretty, pretty like gnarly case. I mean, it wasn't, you weren't hospitalized or anything like that, but like, it wasn't just like a sniffle here and there. No, I was sleeping a lot. I got fatigued very easily. I would get I'm dizzy and lightheaded. Anytime I was up for too long, I had a really bad cough. I would wake up in the in the night with a really bad cough. I had a headache. Like it wasn't fun. It wasn't. And there's also just that added layer of terror of not knowing if you're going to wake up and it's going to be worse the next day, yeah. or if this is going to be with you forever. And that psychological aspect that I think people write off when they talk about, well, everybody's going to get it. It's just going to be the cold. But then you get it, and it's. It's yeah. scary. It is. It's really scary. But yes, I had my partner with me. I had an amazing community response. I, I don't want to dwell on this for too long, but just everybody showed up and 
in ways from all across the country. My friend in Portland, Oregon, my friends in New York, friends in Chicago sent so much love and support and sort of saved Christmas for me, honestly. You were in isolation. You spent Christmas. Yeah, right. Through yeah. Christmas. Yes. That's tough. Just some random person's house. And so we had family deliver Christmas decorations and um, <laughs> Adam's sister pre-made sugar cookies and then made icing and then put them in pipettes and had little plastic baggies of sprinkles so that we could still decorate Christmas cookies and we decorated the whole place. My mom found my childhood Christmas ornaments that we could put on this fake tree. It was wonderful. So I am better now. I'm in New York. I'm thankful to have my health and my family, my community, and to be back here. So you're back. It's wonderful to have you back. Now I'm going to introduce the second part of this and then I will pass the baton to Donnie, but I just want to tell this. <laughs> and if you don't want, if you don't want to keep it in Donnie, we can edit it out. But I want to tell, I want to tell this story, which is that, so Tiffany's back and then we're going to do the, we're going to do the, uh, the mailbag and we're setting up the mailbag. And I got it. And I get a text from Donnie the day before we're going to record the Jamie Raskin podcast. And Donnie will send over a really good like prep package where he's sometimes done a pre-interview. He's done, um, here's some background reading. Here's some articles, some, some themes. If it's a book, here's some of the, so he sends me the text and he says, uh, Hey Chris, is it okay if I send the, the prep tomorrow? I don't know what's going on. It, it, it's really weird. I just feel really tired and I have a headache. I can't really move. And I'm like, literally text back like, Donnie, I think you have COVID. Like, this, I, I'm going to put two and two together here. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then we, anyway, so then what happened? Yeah, I remember that. It was the worst I've ever felt. I was, I'd never felt like that before. I remember mm. I had the the headache. My eyes were hurting. I said, this is different. When my Ooh. eyes started hurting, I knew something was up. I mean, the fatigue, everything, the sore throat, it was the worst night ever. And then the next day or shortly after I went to go get a test and it was the weirdest experience ever. So I'm at, I'm at a testing site. They do, um, they had at home test kits in an in-person testing site outside and they show you how to do it and everything. I get the result. They turn the clipboard back, show me the result. They're like, this is your result. And that was it. It was like the most <laughs> anticlimactic kind of experience of like, I mean, literally I have not eaten out at any restaurants over the past month. I've been intentional about not doing that. I'm not having any visitors, not visiting anyone. When we got together for the holidays, we made sure everyone was tested for COVID, have been vaccinated, all of that. And so it was it was really a shock to me that I got COVID. And then with the result, it was just kind of like, here's your result. And then I turned around and walked home and figured out what am I going to do going forward? So I've been ordering groceries at home. And one of the things that was encouraging for me, though, was um, I love cooking. So this definitely, as I've been doing for the past month, was cooking even more. And I was, remember I was cutting up some ingredients, making a chicken soup, and I could actually smell the soup cooking. So I'm like, yes, at least I didn't lose <laughs> my sense Yeah, of no, that's a... <laughs> dude, there are people on... I occasionally see these TikToks of people who have had COVID a while ago and don't have like long COVID in the sense of you know, enduring fatigue or like brain fog. But the one thing that has endured is loss of smell and taste. And that seems really, really, really unsettling. And I'm I'm glad that yours is back. And I'm glad that both of you are feeling better. You both had like, I mean, you both really got, you got walloped. And I'm glad that you're you're back and we're, we're all here together virtually. Well, and the, exactly. the punchline of that is that that also delayed our second attempt at recording this mailbag. So then when we had it scheduled for today, uh, we you told watch Chris out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. wrap up, wrap, wrap, watch out, it's coming buddy. for you. <laughs> the yeah, at least we theory. have our antibodies now. We're it's, Presumably, I guess we're more protected. We'll see. Well, I will say that I also know people, I mean, yeah. obviously, uh, you know, this the, the, the amount of cases are crazy, and particularly in New York. I definitely know a few people who got like entirely asymptomatic cases that were just caught because of like routine testing. You know, if they were at a, I know some of the, some people that work in TV that have to be in who got like to the point of like, they wouldn't have known that they had COVID, And at no point would they have known that they had COVID except for the fact that they had, and I'm just like, so jealous of that. <laughs> just like <laughs> if there are a way to just get like a fully asymptomatic, like the antibodies are there. It never manifests. You never know about it. you like, but yeah, no, your point, Tiffany, I think is a really good one. Like, just about the psychology of it and the fact that like being sick 
with a novel, literally, I mean, that's what they call it. It's the novel coronavirus yeah. is like harrowing. All right, should we hit the mailbag? Yeah, yeah. So we're all here. We're all healthy. We're all <laughs> hoping for 2022 to just. You say that now. Yeah, we'll see. Knock on wood. <laughs> I mean, I trust you guys are because <laughs> we'll see how long I last. But. Um, so we'll get to the mailbag. We'll get to your questions. But to the point of we're hoping for a bigger and better 2022, we have an exciting milestone that we're hitting uh, on with Pod at the beginning of the year. And that is our 200th episode. We'll be publishing our 200th episode of WithPod in February. That blows my mind, man. It's something we're really proud of. We're, we've been around yeah. for a long time. This little side project has been around for over three years now. We've had a really great guest and conversations. And based off of our inbox, based off our mailbag, you have many of you have been around for a long time. Many of you have been around yeah. from the beginning. And really have connected with the show in a way that is the most gratifying part of my job and my my tenure with the podcast and with the show is just knowing how much you all have connected with it. And so to that end, we are going to ask something from you. So to celebrate our 200th episode that we're publishing in February, we want to hear from you. We want to learn more about you. If you are comfortable and able to send us a quick audio recording or a video where you introduce yourself to us, Tell us where you live, and then answer one of these questions. Which of all of our episodes is your favorite, and why? Why did it resonate with you? Or where do you listen to WithPod? If it is between school drop-off and going to work, if it's when you're out walking your dog, if you're gardening, where is it that you like to listen? Or um, why do you listen to WithPod? What keeps you coming back for more? Why do you have this in your queue? Why are you subscribed? Why did you leave a five-star rating? Any of those reasons, just put that in a quick recording, preferably 30 seconds or less so that we can try and do something with them, maybe edit them together, put them into an episode, or maybe it'll just be for us, but we really want to hear from you. So if you could do that, record a video, record just an audio snippet, and then email it to us at withpod at gmail.com, and we'll see what we can do with that. I love it. Um, I, I was joking before that I love I love soliciting compliments, so if you want to throw in like what was the funniest joke I made or <laughs> something like that. Like you also throw that in there. <laughs> the most All genius, compliments like, welcome. Yeah, yeah, whatever galaxy brain idea that Chris had that really you're like, wow, that's great. Yeah. Um, so wow. now let's get into what we did last year. If you can believe we started the year with an episode about bourbon, uh, we really wanted to have a totally different conversation. Chris, if you remember, like the end of the year, we thought we've talked enough about the election. We've talked enough about COVID. We're going to do something different. We're going to do this episode uh, about bourbon. And it was really well received. People loved it. And then that episode was published on January 5th. <laughs> and then oh, wow. the next day, January 6th, sort of defined our news cycle. Uh, the next yep. episode that we had was with ta Coates talking about January 6th and the bigger picture. But I think this year we managed to get away from the stories that are driving the cable side of things, the news coverage, like going back and looking at what we talked about. We had episodes about art with Anna Devere Smith, Ani DeFranco, filmmaking with Alex Gibney. We talked a lot about tech, NFTs, yep. Bitcoin, Wikipedia, YouTube with Natalie Wynn. We talked about healthcare with Dr. Hochez on vaccines, Dr. Izzy Lowell on trans health. We did a lot of international episodes. We did everything from like Al Broker to UFOs. We sort of paved our own way, I think, in a year where yep. it's easy to have news fatigue on the biggest stories. And we really created our own lane. Yeah, I really liked, I want to say that I really liked those. You, you named them together in their, my head there together, which is Ani DeFranco, Anna DeVere Smith, and Alex Gibney, which are all kind of conversations about the creative process. All of which I really enjoyed. You know, there was that show Forever Inside the Actor Studio with James Lipton. Yes. You know, I like like writers interviewing writers, like partly because we our work is pretty generative. Like we have a blank, we have a blank page every day that we have to fill. That's what we do every day. And I've I also write books and I'm working on some other writing projects. And so I'm always really fascinated in the creative process, how people make stuff and what how they find their way to the stuff they make. And I found those really illuminating and exciting and kind of inspiring too, which I like. Like, 
there's a bunch of conversations we had this year. The Dr. Izzy Lowell one was also really inspiring, even though it's in a very dark context of this awful kind of like political war on these kids who she uh, is seeing in her practice. But her steadfastness was really inspiring. I guess it was the last one of the year, but the Casey Johnston weightlifting conversation I really loved. That one was also fun because people came out of the woodwork who you wouldn't, who I didn't know, like people I know who are like actually like big, like I called them progressive meatheads. Um, <laughs> we're, 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 we're sort of, I had like all these people, I had all these people texting me or, or emailing me and being like, yeah, like I got really into weightlifting this year too, or I really, hmm. this is really uh, uh, important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found it transformative. So yeah, I think I totally agree. And I think one of the things that's really nice about this space is we have, you we could have conversations about a whole variety of things. And I think like we are all people with various interests, curiosities, broad things that we're interested in the way that news cycles function and the way cable news functions is that it's pretty, you tend to sort of really focus and and stay on the, on those beats. And so it's really refreshing for me. I really enjoy like the, the sort of breadth of it. Yeah. We'll get into some of the, the ways that we sort of construct the conversations we want to have, but there's a lot that we did this last year too, that we were able to do since Donnie joined some really cool things that we've been able to accomplish. Totally, yeah. Speaking of the creative process, we always strive to be creative here at WithPod and to do new things. Um, One of the newest things that we did, which was super exciting at the top of this year, was we had our recent All In WithPod collab. So, of course, All In, the cable show airing at 8 p.m. on MSNBC weekdays, we (laughs) did something... Really cool there, where we had a correspondent for the Atlantic, Bart Gelman, as well as Sherilyn Eiffel, the head of the NACP Legal Defense Fund. So we had a conversation which aired on TV where you, our listeners and viewers got to see part of the conversation and hear part of the conversation on TV, but could only get the full conversation on the WithPod feed. So that was a lot of fun. We had a different look for the TV show. Yeah, I really liked that. I thought that came out great. I, yeah. I, I mean, it was a fun experiment, but I loved it. Like, I loved doing it. I thought it looked fantastic on air. It was a very distinct look, and I'm glad that we're looking at doing more of those episodes. It was a lot of fun. Another thing that we've done is videos on social media. So we'd love to be able to give our listeners and viewers on Twitter and other social media platforms the opportunity to see videos of our guests. So kind of get to see a different view. So as you're listening to our conversations, you might kind of be wondering the visual. And now for many of our conversations, you get to see those on social media. So that's been fun. We now feature it in our MSNBC Daily Newsletter you might be wondering, how can you subscribe to that? Well, it's pretty <laughs> pretty easy. All you have to do is just go to msnbc.com forward slash newsletters. You can click on the MSNBC Daily logo on there, type in your email address, and then you can make sure you stay abreast weekly with our Love latest it. episodes and the content we have coming out. That's great. And... One other thing that we're doing this new is our listener question segment. So love to hear from you all. We love your feedback, love your questions. And you can always stay tuned on Twitter for those opportunities where you can submit your questions. We'll occasionally do a call to action. You can see those on Chris's Twitter and submit your questions and get your answers from our expert guests. So speaking of questions, we've got some mailbag questions, right? Yes. And we get everything in our mailbag. We have, I got to say, our listeners are so dedicated. It's been super fun. I know this is something that Tiffany shared with me when I first started. It's just all the the emails that come into the inbox. And certainly I've seen that. One of the things that we got recently, someone said, we want more Kate Shaw on WithPod. <laughs> that that one was super interesting to me. So we listened to that and we have a crossover episode that's out now. So you can hear that conversation and talking all about the Supreme Court cases to watch in 2022. No shortage of things there. Yeah. And we should say that um, if you've listened to that episode, which is out now, that episode, which we noted in the episode, happened before the Supreme Court's vaccine mandate case, which only further kind of <laughs> makes the point. But that crossover, which is another crossover episode of Kate Shaw, who is my wife, for those that don't know, the light of my life and the <laughs> love of my life. And I, we've been together since uh, we were 19-year-old freshman at Brown, and we have three kids together. And she, among many, many things that Kate does, she has this great podcast on the court and the culture of the court called Strict Scrutiny. Two other women who are law professors, Melissa Murray and Leah Littman. And you should check that out if you're interested in the law in any way. 
Totally. And also binge all of our Kate Shaw episodes on WithPod because they are both amazingly informative and worth revisiting, even if you've listened to them. But also <laughs> Chris's precious fawning over Kate is just hard eyes, hard eye emojis. <laughs> yeah. It's the audio so version adorable. of hard eye emoji. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And uh, speaking of cross collaborative things too, well, one thing, um, some synergy that we had, we also had another guest who was on Strict Scrutiny this past year, um, Alexandra Brodsky. She was also on Strict Scrutiny. So it was, it's always cool when we have that overlap. Yeah. And she wrote a great book about sexual justice and, and sort of thinking about conceptualizing sexual assault, sexual harassment, how institutions can grapple with them in a sort of more formalized and equitable way than what has happened before. That's a great conversation, both with us and with strict scrutiny. It's an important one. And echoing a question, Chris, that we get often, and this is one that we've heard throughout the years, and it's for this year, which interview you did in 2021 has stuck with you the most? And why did it stick with you the most? And relatedly, what was the most surprising or intriguing thing that you learned from a guest? Hmm. (laughs) Well, I think that Izzy Lowell conversation in some ways stuck with me the most. And what I think stuck with me about it was, it was a really good reminder that sometimes we have these big fights about stuff that are like issues and they're fights and they're culture war polemics. And this is an obvious point, but you could lose sight of the fact that there's just people at the center of that. They're like actual people whose mm-hmm. actual lives and skin, their bodies, their their hormones, their medication, their psychological well-being are all like, what is at stake? And I know that intellectually, but listening to Dr. Izzy Lowell, who runs a clinic in the South, which is basically the only clinic in the South that does healthcare for trans youth, you know, just even talking through what we're talking about when we're talking about trans youth, what trans youth treatment looks like, what her patients' lives are like, what brings them to her clinic. It's so easy sometimes to lose sight of the basic human component of these kind of culture war battles, even when you're you know, waging them on the side of, I support healthcare for trans youth. And that's the part of this culture war battle that I'm on, uh, which I would say very strongly for myself is true. And just, I was just very inspired by her as a person, like her very humble, but determined kind of like quiet, righteous goodness and decency really, really stuck with me. And it also highlighted how monstrous in some way, like her very (laughs) non-polemical, presentation of the work that she does in some ways made me more radicalized (laughs) and angry about the attacks on her work than the sort of description of it in the political terms. And so to me, it was really a really useful and important kind of regrounding of the conversation. And so that's really, that's really, really stuck with me. We'll be back after this quick break. Another question that we got, we have a lot of authors come on with pod. So we get a lot of people who have written, whether they're journalists or they've written amazing books, books that end up making it on President Obama's <laughs> list of the year, <laughs> all kinds of different guests. We'll get into that a little bit. But this question comes from Daniel and he says, when and how do you consume all the books you read for this pod and for pleasure? Are you an audiobook listener or do you prefer a hard copy? He says he's a new dad, eight month year old. He's finishing his PhD, so he never seems to have the time or energy to read outside of work. What's your secret? Well, I don't, I'm not finishing a PhD, so that's, <laughs> um, that's key. I mean, to be honest, part of my secret is the podcast because it, the podcast requires me to read a lot. And I partly like the discipline of that. I'm pretty fast and I retain things pretty well. And that's always been a really important attribute for the work that I do. So, I mean, I also do some skimming. Like, I, and I think that's fine. Like, I think with, honestly, I think with nonfiction books, you know, I've written two nonfiction books. If you've read a chapter of each of them, like, I'm happy, you know, <laughs> like, um, or, or, if, or if you've read a few chapters of each of them, like, I mean, I would love for you to read every sentence of my book. But like, I think with nonfiction books, like, you can... In many of them, you could move around and and take away a lot without reading them cover to cover, and I think that's fine. Mostly in most for most nonfiction books, and a lot of the you know the books we're reading, you, you can't really do that with a novel. But most of the most of the books we're doing here are nonfiction. The one novel we did, I think, was Salman Rushdie's, which I did read the whole thing. So that's that's part of it too. And then you know, 
having the discipline of having to do it, if I'm going to talk to someone about their book, I better have read, you know, at least some of it, if not most of it or all of it, you know, that, that really helps me. And so I, I would say like, get a podcast where you have to interview authors, but that's not really <laughs> operationalizable um, feedback. I will say that I do listen to audiobooks. Kate has become a real audiobook convert. It is very useful to have the possibility of book consumption while dog walking, while errand running, while walking back from dropping my, my youngest, you know, preschool is a pretty long walk. So I've got a 20 minute walk back from that 50 minute walk back from that. So I, I do that as well. Something else that you said once on a mailbag many moons ago is that you will have e-readers on your phone. And just when you have that impulse to check Twitter, or you have that impulse to check Instagram, instead open up that e-reader. And that's something I've instituted in my own life. And I found that to be better for my brain. And also I'm getting more reading done, just that little in between time. It's so great too for subway, like as a subway yeah. thing too, because like, I'll forget my book or I won't bring the book, but I always have my phone and it will mark where I've left off. And when I, particularly if I know I'm interviewing someone that week, like, you know, when Omicron isn't happening or in more normal back and forth, it's, you know, 35 minutes on the train each way. Like that's an hour of reading that I could just mindlessly be scrolling Twitter which let's be clear, I do a lot of that as well, <laughs> but <laughs> don't get me wrong. <laughs> but yeah, that's also been a useful hack. We got a tweet from Larry. One of our favorite types of feedback is something that he said, which is every once in a while, the topic of an episode of with pod is unappealing to me, but I'll start it anyways. And every single time I become engaged, interested and entertained, that's the best feedback. Honestly, one of the best things that we can hear is that we were able to present a conversation that you wouldn't otherwise have maybe been interested in or thought you would want to learn about and at the end are informed. That's great. And this kind of relates to a question that we got from Kurt that I'm curious how you would want to talk about it. They sort of expressed skepticism about how we say, well, we can we talk about whatever we want. We're able to have the conversations that we want to have. So Kurt wants to know how constrained are we by the editorial policies and priorities of our employer? when it comes to choosing the types of conversations that we want to have? Oh, we're not constrained at all. I mean, really, really zero, zero, zero. There are constraints on cable news in the program that are not from our employer. There are the constraints of ratings and attention. And those are real. I mean, you, you know, we there's an expectation that we have people watch our show. <laughs> and there are things that are sort of attracting people's attention in the news cycle and things that are not. And, you know, that we try to do kind of a mix of, to be honest, um, <laughs> to keep people's attention. And when we try to do things that are are not really like driving people's attention, we will find a way to do it in a way we think will. But here, I mean, part of what makes this platform really special is two things. One, those pressures don't really exist. And two, the nature of podcast consumption is just it gets back to the point that I think Larry made. You know, that's how I used to consume like physical magazines like The New Yorker. Like I would get a New Yorker and I would just basically like look through and maybe I would look through the cable contents and I would start with something I was interested in. But I, then I'd end up backing my way around to like a profile of a botanist. <laughs> it would be like, I don't know, <laughs> do I want to read a profile of a botanist? And then I'd be like, whoa, this is a fascinating botanist. And I would be happy that I read the article because I trusted that the incredibly talented people that make that magazine would find something interesting, compelling, and I would learn from. And I think people consume podcasts that way much more than they consume cable news that way. Cable news is, there's a little bit of a, like an itch your trigger finger. You've got the remote there. You're also consuming it at a specific time, which is like 8 p.m., where with a magazine or a podcast, you can like maybe you're lounging on a Sunday or maybe you're going for a walk with a dog and it's kind of in the background. So there's different ways people consume different media, all of which to say, I think people often really overestimate the degree of bosses telling us what to cover and vastly underestimate how hard it is to get people to watch your television show or listen to your podcast and how much that drives things more than any instruction. And in the case of the podcast, there's basically, I mean, there truly is zero direction. We brainstorm things that we're interested in, and then we talk to people about those topics. Yes. And it truly is the things that keeps Chris up late at night. I will <laughs> I will affirm that. True to the tagline, um, Chris, through Slack, through various channels, texts, it really is the things that he's thinking about at all times. Yeah, we just did. We just recorded a podcast yesterday, and I don't know, it'll probably not be out yet about Afghanistan with an on Gopal. 
we've been trying to book him on the show. It's been a little hard because he's been out of country. But, you know, that that's a topic that keep me up at night is like slightly hyperbolic, but is really, really upsetting and anxiety producing about what's going to happen there. And, and you know, we've done it a bit on the show, but this is an opportunity to have a longer conversation. And sometimes they're, like you said, articles that you were like, oh, this is interesting. Case in point, Dr. Herman Ponser about how we convert calories to energy, uh, which is was one that I was left talking about for like many days after. Like, oh, he said this other thing. Can you believe it? You would be surprised. Here's a question from John. How do you, and I know we're running out of time, so just quickly, how do you conceptualize expertise in pursuit of truth? <laughs> Did you ever consider pursuing an advanced degree? And what advantages do you think journalism offers when searching for truth? I did consider an advanced degree in philosophy. I considered going to philosophy grad school. I'm very glad that I did not do that, <laughs> even though I'm very grateful for my philosophy training and, and grounding. The question of expertise is a really, really fraught one and, and actually comes up a lot in this show because, because it's like a single guest interview, we're sort of investing the person with a certain amount of authority. And, you know, one person's perspective on the state of Afghanistan or vaccines or whatever isn't the sum total of the truth about that topic, almost definitionally, which I think listeners should always keep in mind. You know, this has been a real issue in like the most popular podcast in America, which is the Joe Rogan podcast. You know, sometimes you will encounter Joe Rogan conversations that are far from the areas of like vaccine denialism that are just like super great, fascinating, good, really good long form podcast interviews. Like, Brian Greene on like the origins of time, who's like a physicist who writes about the birth of the universe. And like, that's just, a, it's a great pod. He's a very good podcast. He's a very good interviewer. The problem a little bit with that show is just like who gets imbued with authority. And that is a deep, deep question that I think we wrestle with a little bit. I, I Sometimes we will have someone who some people think they're wrong. <laughs> Their main thrust is wrong. And not because like, oh, I don't like those person politics, but like, no, this this person isn't the authority you think they are. You know, there's a fallibility there. I think that the posture of the conversations are not going to be real, like, hostile cross examine just because I think that's just not that enjoyable to listen to, you know, in, in general. It's harder to get more out of that. But it is something I think we keep in mind about who are we conferring authority on, at the same time that I would say that no one should ever think that so-and-so's pronouncements on a topic are the final word and the sum total of authority about that topic. They just definitionally cannot be. And I do think there's something a little slippery there that John is rightly pointing towards, actually. And I think to the final point about like truth, I think that journalism at its best is just relentlessly curious and humble and is trying to understand the world in good faith with the knowledge that total understanding is impossible. <laughs> and, you know, that is the project that you want to try to go through your professional work with that kind of animating you. And another question to the point. So we have a lot, as you said, we had a lot of experts, people with differing views. But one thing that I think that we can agree on is that there are some reasons to be hopeful. And that speaks to the question that we got from Aaron, who's a longtime listener of ours. And he says, there's a lot of reasons for feeling doom and gloom right now, ranging from BBB, Build Back Better, stalling, Senate Democrats seemingly being unable to pull the country back from a lurch into authoritarianism and the climate crisis, just to name a few. He asks, what gives you hope? Well, a few things. One is that I'm a pretty optimistic person by nature and disposition. I think thinking about things in historical and philosophical terms really helps me be hopeful. I was just texting with someone back and forth about Abraham Lincoln in like 63, 64, before the war starts to turn. And at that Your point, group it's chats like. chats are different than mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was not a group. This is not like. No. My group chats with my friends are like literally me being like, here's the sandwich I made for lunch today. Like, I'm a TikTok sandwich person. <laughs> this has been a running bit I've done where I'm like, oh, what do we got here, boys? Oh, a little grilled cheese with Calabrian peppers. Oh, that's my. That's it's my, a joke my, until it's real, Chris. Watch out. No, no. Oh, believe me. I 100% want to be a sandwich TikToker. <laughs> not even joking. Um, that's going to be the next that's side project. advice from Hank Green. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, so I was texting someone about, we were going back and forth about 
the current state of the situation. And, you know, just the bleakest hours of, the, of Lincoln's Civil War, McClellan, who was screwing things up and doing a horrible job, and it looked like the North was going to lose, and lots of the public opinion in the North was sort of turning against the war in a really dangerous way, like, maybe we should just let him go, and like, this is too, you know you know, darkest before the dawn kind of moment, but there's a lot of darkest before the dawn moments throughout history. And I think like reminding yourself of that is really, really important. And to me, gives me a lot of hope. And then taking the long view about the fact that history can be tough and and brutal at times. And there's a weird, like, it's not like a stoic detachment, but I think understanding things in a broader sweep of humans struggling for making meaning and producing a world that is, you know, as just and equitable and humane as possible as like an ongoing, never ending project that there's no end point to. And being part of that project as best you can is what gives life meaning to me, at least. And that is the thing that I fall back on, you know, in the absence of a religious faith, which would be nice, honestly, <laughs> to have it, uh, in, in, in some ways, but I, I just am not, I don't have it. So this is my secular version of that, which I think is what we have to work with. All right. Final question, Chris, hard hitter. What's your favorite part about having a dog? Oh, we love it. Um, <laughs> Gosh, I love so many things about having a dog. Let me tell you, I, I, well, I love belly rubs. Um, I love, like, I love it when she, I love it when she comes over and just like presents her belly to me to rub because, mm -hmm. but the thing I really, I love the affection. I love watching their minds work more than anything. I think it's really incredible. It's just an incredible thing to watch this alien brain operating sensing you, coming to understand certain things, and the process of bonding and forming a relationship and something that feels like genuine, like reciprocal love <laughs> across a boundary of species and language. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I am finding it a really magical experience and I'm completely, completely in love with my dog. This is what gives me hope is people adopting dogs. If you can adopt a dog, adopt a dog, man. Yeah. It's great. So if you can great. foster a dog, foster a dog. That's what gives me hope. So sweet. We should do an episode. We on should. That. We should do it. I would love to do it. Let's do that. Let's do an episode on dogs. All right. I have to go. Yeah. I'm going to let you guys do the outro. Cool. All right. Sounds like a All plan. right. We got um, it. All right. All right. Talk to you later, Chris. Stay healthy, everyone. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Bye, Chris. Bye. I know we promised this earlier in the conversation, the With Pod guests making it on former President Obama's favorite books of 2021 list. And we talked about hope in this conversation. Of course, President Obama talked a lot about hope in his campaign. Some of the books that made it on former President Obama's favorite books of 2021 list include How the Word is Passed. That was by Clint Smith. We had him on the podcast. The Invisible Child by Andrea Elliott and A Life in China with Taiping Chen. So we have a lot of good authors here, and it was cool to see those authors make it on former President Obama's list as well. Yeah, I know we were one of his uh, most listened to podcasts. He's just too afraid to put it. You know, it's okay, <laughs> President Obama. It's you coming, can, it's coming. You can admit it, it's fine. <laughs> we know you're out there listening. Now, yeah, I know you're listening right now. Michelle, you tell him what's up. <laughs> And join the chorus of, of listeners. We did something really cool. Chris did a call to action on Twitter asking for listener raps from Spotify. So Spotify does this really cool thing where it'll tell you at the end of the year how many episodes you listen to and for how long. I think this really speaks to the dedication of our WithPod listeners because when we did the initial call to action, when we announced the winner, it was someone named Asher who had listened to 45 episodes for a total of 2,495 minutes. And then after that was published, we actually heard back from someone who was really on it. Shayna listened, our new winner. Shayna listened for 3,522 minutes for a total of 67 episodes. I think that's more episodes than we did in the whole year. Yeah, it, it literally is. I mean, maybe there was a binge in there. Welcome to the family, Shayna. <laughs> if you're new, that is admirable. But yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. We hope you learned something. Don't forget, 200th episode, send in your submission, 30-second video or an audio clip. Hi, my name is Tiffany. I live in New York. I love listening to Why Is This Happening because it teaches me things I wouldn't otherwise learn. Boom. <laughs> 
This has certainly been a lot of fun and it's always great to do our mailbag. Hope you've enjoyed it. Why Is This Happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In team, features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to nbcnews.com forward slash why is this happening? Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs>